Okay, uh, you all should be seeing my uh, screen at this point, I believe. That's correct. Great. All right, we're off to the races. So um, again, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity here and I uh, wanna acknowledge my co-authors off the bat, uh, Dr. Jeff Buckle and Dr. Paul Rudershausen, uh, who uh, completed a lot of this work um, both uh, with me and then uh, one of the studies I'm gonna talk about uh, was, was completed before my time at NC State University. So. Uh, what exactly are reef fishes in the South Atlantic? Well, you may know them as the snapper grouper complex. I prefer to think of them as the reef fish complex because they're not all snappers and groupers. Uh, you also have grunts and porgies, triggerfish, tilefish, hogfish, jacks, um, a, a whole bunch of different species. And there are actually 55 uh, species currently managed as reef fish in the South Atlantic. And this is a really challenging group to manage, as many of you are, are well aware. Uh, and the main problem there is that these animals tend to cohabitate. So at any given time, any given location, you might drop a baited hook and you uh, could catch a reef fish and it could be any number of um, different species. It could be one of, you know, off North Carolina, perhaps 25 or 30 different species. Um, and these different species have a, a range of conservation statuses. So a couple examples here just to orient everyone. Um, Vermilion snapper, uh, a popular recreational and commercial target was uh, assessed uh, recently to be healthy. Um, snowy grouper sort of have a middle of the road conservation status. They've been assessed to be overfished, uh, but not undergoing overfishing. And then speckled hind, another grouper species, um, is thought to be undergoing overfishing, but it's unknown if they're overfished, uh, mostly because they're, they're a naturally rare species. Uh, they live in very deep water and they're just overall data deficient. And so because of this range of conservation statuses, um, you also have this, this wide range of regulations, this complex regulatory framework. And uh, I won't go through each of these, but I, I'm showing them on the screen here. And suffice it to say that uh, the regulations for a vermilion snapper are very different than they are for a speckled hunt. And because these fish live in the same place and, and will often take the same bait, this results in a, a lot of what we call regulatory discards or fish that are released because they're illegal to uh, retain. There's been a general trend through time with a lot of uh, reef fish species. Um, I'm showing you recreational data here from the Emirate program. Uh, the y-axis is releases as a proportion of total catch. And this is a five-year moving average from uh, the early 1980s until the present day. And so what you can see here is for all four species that I'm showing you, which are reef species, you can see the legend which species I'm, I'm uh, describing here. For all four species, the proportion of catch that is released has increased substantially since the beginning of the time period. Take black sea bass, for example, the green line. In the 1980s, about four out of every 10 black sea bass were released in this region. Uh, in present day, it's more like nine or 9.5 out of 10 black sea bass uh, wind up getting released. So why is this an issue? Um, well, catch and release is great uh, if the fish that are released actually survive. Um, it brings me to my favorite headline from The Onion, the satirical news source, which is, Ethical hunter throws duck he shot back in the sky. Uh, well, that duck is dead. Um, some of the fish that get released uh, are also dead. But unlike waterfowl, you can't actually tell if a released fish, or you can't always tell if a released fish uh, is going to survive the, the catch and release process. So there are a, a, a wide range of injuries that can be sustained by um, fish after they're released. Uh, and uh, they range from hooking injury to predation related mortality events, but also uh, one that's really, really important for the research that I've done uh, and is, is specific to reef fish is barotrauma. Barotrauma is pressure-related injury that occurs when you bring a fish that lives at the seafloor up to the surface. And uh, the gases in the swim bladder and other organs of that animal expand because of that pressure differential. And this can result in organ damage and displacement. The top left photo is a black sea bass that's experiencing what we call stomach eversion. The swim bladder has expanded and is pushing uh, the stomach out the mouth of that fish. The gray trigger fish in the top right has an intestinal prolapse. Um, in the bottom left, there's a snowy grouper. We're looking down on the head of that fish and the, the eyeballs are actually bugging out of the head there. That's a, a corneal gas embolus has occurred. It's a, a fairly severe uh, manifestation of barotrauma. And then in the bottom right, everybody's favorite reef fish, red snapper, uh, is um, there has experienced severe enough barotrauma that it's unable to resubmerge by itself. It's trapped floating at the surface. 
uh, and this is, uh, of course, generally a lethal condition. Fish do not survive uh, if they cannot swim down on their own. So our big research question here is, do reef fish survive release? And this is increasingly important for stock assessments. I showed you that trend uh, for those four species, but it's, th that trend is, is pretty much a general trend um, for uh, most reef fish species and, and fish species in general in the United States. And so what I'm going to talk about today are uh, several methods whereby we can estimate what proportion of released fish survive. I want to first talk about a couple methods uh, that I'm not a huge fan of, but have been used in some studies, and they are um, a hyperbaric chamber and a, a cage or otherwise uh, enclosed apparatus. Uh, hyperbaric chambers are expensive, um, they're difficult to build, and uh, you have to take them on board and put a fish individually in there, seal it up, and then repressurize it to observe what sort of physiological damage the fish has sustained uh, as a result of, of barotrauma. Uh, cages, you, you can put a fish in there and then enable it with a video camera or some other means of observation uh, and then drop it back down to the seafloor. Um, but I'm not a big fan of these either. Uh, again, hyperbaric chambers are expensive, but both of these things exclude predators and they also exclude food. So um, you don't get a really nice clean look at how that fish would survive uh, if it were released and allowed to um, go back into the wild. Uh, so that, that's the last you're going to hear from me on, on hyperbaric chambers and cages. Um, but what I want to do is go through three different methodologies uh, that I have used to try to estimate release mortality. Uh, and I'm going to give you some case studies here. I'm going to focus more on the methods, but I'm also going to give you some results because I know that this is this, most of you find this interesting work. Um, and so the first method that I'm going to talk about is uh, condition-specific survival, which I'm going to refer to as bottom-up uh, estimation here. And we're going to look at two different species, black sea bass and gray triggerfish. I'm going to walk through these two studies uh, sort of concurrently because the methods were very similar. These studies were both conducted by NC State Seamast, uh, and the cooperator on both of these studies was Captain Tom Burgess, who uh, at one time was a member of the South Atlantic Council. Um, Black sea bass study took place in Onslow Bay. Gray triggerfish study took place in Raleigh Bay, but uh, just know that they both took place off of North Carolina. And we use conventional tagging for this work. Um, I'm gonna let you know right now that as we go through the study, I'm gonna tell you uh, a couple of monetary values of some of the materials that we used in these studies, because I know that it's, it's often um, not really talked about how much this kind of work costs. So uh, for both of these studies, we used Floy internal anchor tags. Uh, these tags cost about $1.50 each, and they had a statement of uh, reward and a phone number on the tag so that if someone caught the fish, uh, ideally, they would call it in and say, yeah, we caught number uh, 21065, and uh, we would send them a baseball hat or a t-shirt uh, and a letter, thank you very much for your participation. In these studies, we categorized released fish by their external condition. Um, for the black sea bass study, the four conditions are on the screen, no visible trauma, visible barrow trauma, hook trauma, and then floating fish. Uh, the gray triggerfish study, we didn't have a hook trauma condition because all the gray triggerfish were hooked in the mouth. They have very small mouths, and it's, it's difficult for them to swallow the hook. So for this study, uh, we used basically a, a relative risk survival estimation um, where the survival rate for a given group, in this case groups two, three, or four, is calculated relative to the survival rate of uh, the best conditioned fish. For the slide I'm showing you right here, the best condition is group one, no visible trauma. But that's making the assumption that those fish have 100% survival, that, that even the fish uh, that we, um, that, or excuse me, the fish that we see no visible trauma uh, on are not experiencing any uh, release mortality whatsoever. But this assumption may not be uh, great because those fish might have latent or, or cryptic trauma uh, that could decrease their chances of survival post-release. So for both of these studies, we used scuba divers uh, to obtain a robust control group that were not exposed to those various stressors like hook trauma uh, and then um, uh, most importantly, barrow trauma. Uh, and so to do this scuba uh, diving experiment costs about $1,000 per boat day. Or send a couple divers down, hire Tom Burgess uh, to drive the boat, things like that. Give you an example of uh, what that estimation procedure looked like. So let's say we went out and we tagged 20 black sea bass at the surface. Uh, and then on the same day, in the same location, we send scuba divers down to pull fish out of traps one by one uh, and tag them, another 20. So 
So in this experiment, the location and time are exactly equal between these two groups. And the only difference between them is that those that are released at the surface has, have been exposed to uh, the capture-related injuries, including hook trauma and barrow trauma. If we then get relatively few tag returns from the surface-released group as compared to the seafloor or scuba control group, that would uh, imply or suggest higher discard mortality or release mortality. So just using this approximation here, let's say we get 6 out of 20 back uh, from the surface group and 10 out of 20 back uh, from the scuba control group, that would reduce down to a survival estimate of about 60% or 0 0.6. So I'll give you some results here uh, for both studies at the same time. Um, the black sea bass was a, a pretty large study that took place over a number of years. Uh, over 5,000 fish were released, um, received over uh, 1,200 recaptures. And using that relative risk model, uh, the survival rate for condition one fish that were released at the surface but had no visible trauma was estimated to be 0.87 or 87%. And that's relative to that robust uh, scuba control. That survival rate was lower uh, in compromised conditions. Hook trauma in particular in this species was, uh, was severe. Uh, but this finding was in line with previous findings for this species uh, and lined up with um, pretty closely with what had been used as the release mortality estimate uh, in assessments for black sea bass. Um, this paper was a 2014 paper in Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences. Uh, Paul Jeff and Dr. Joe Hightower were the authors on that. Uh, it was funded by Sea Grant on North Carolina. Um, so the great triggerfish study, this was actually part of my master's degree. Uh, we tagged about 700 triggerfish. We got about 250 recaptures. We used a little more advanced modeling technique uh, and I won't get into the nitty gritty of, um, at this point, it's called a Cox proportional hazards model, but it's, uh, it's a little more time variant than the relative risk model. And we found that condition one survival, uh, best condition surface release great triggerfish only had a survival rate of 0 0.39 uh, or about call it 40% relative to that scuba control. Uh, and still, this was even lower for fish in compromised conditions. Of course, the floating fish, we actually received no recaptures from, um, and fish that that, uh, that had visible barrow trauma uh, had lower survival still. Um, and interestingly, this finding was was quite a bit below previous findings for gray trigger fish, uh, and, and far below what had previously been used in gray trigger fish assessments. Uh, this study is published in Fisheries Research, uh, and it was funded by the Cooperative Research Program, uh, a NOAA, um, research program. And uh, again, I'm, I'm not trying to focus on the results here, but I know there's some curiosity uh, about why that why that uh, mortality was so high for great trigger fish. Um, our suspicion here that, that we uh, discovered when we performed some necropsies on retained trigger fish is that this, this interesting latent or cryptic uh, form of barotrauma is uh, where the intestine has come forward into the buccal or, or mouth cavity. Um, is probably causing a lot of mortality. So the, the right-hand photo, you can see uh, the intestine right up there in the mouth, uh, and the left-hand photo, panel A, uh, the, the buccal cavity is clear. Um, so this happened for a, a pretty high proportion of the fish, great trigger fish that had no external injury. So there's um, the, the, the best condition or condition one group is actually a flawed uh, condition assigned to them. So anyway, uh, moving on from the great trigger fish and black sea bass bottom-up control, um, I'm calling that bottom up because the, the control group that we used uh, is the best condition uh, fish. The scuba control um, are the fish that we suspect experience the highest survival rate. What I'm going to talk about now is a study that is um, also a black sea bass study. And I'm calling it a top down uh, type of study because, as you'll see in a moment, the control group uh, off of which all of the survival rates for other groups were based are those that in this study we expected would have the lowest survival. So here we're going to compare a couple of types of barotrauma relief, and these are uh, descender devices and venting. Um, if you're not familiar with descender devices, uh, they are any device that's capable of returning a barotraumatized fish uh, back to or near the depth where it was captured. Uh, and the idea is to get it low enough to drag it down but with some weight, uh, to get it low enough in the water column that the pressure is high enough that the expanded gases uh, recompress and the fish can swim under its own power. Uh, venting um, or fizzing a fish, there's a picture of on the right hand side of the screen, is accomplished by inserting a needle or other cannulated device into the abdomen of the fish and releasing 
uh, and relieving some of that built up uh, uh, gas that has expanded during barotrol. So the experimental design for this study involved three different experimental apparatuses, a, a 16 gauge needle, an 11 gauge black handled venting tool, and then the black tip descender device, which is the type of descender device that returns the fish all the way to the seafloor. It's actually triggered by uh, the weight on the device contacting the seafloor. Here we use T-bar tags. Uh, there's Dr. P Dr. Rudishausen right there tagging a uh, severely barotraumatized black sea bass. Uh, these tags cost about 80 cents a pop. And we rotated the release treatments uh, from Treatment one, which was none, the surface control. So we tag the fish and throw them back at the surface. And then the two types of venting followed by the descender device and then back to the start. Uh, this study also took place off of the central North Carolina coast. And to estimate survival here, we use uh, a Cox proportional hazards regression model that estimates recapture probability for each treatment. So that's one, two, three, or four that I'm showing you on the screen now um, as a function of time. So how long has it been since that fish was released uh, until it was recaptured? And then we also included covariates for how big the fish was, uh, and then a random effect for which day or trip uh, the fish was tagged on. And recapture probability here, we're using as a proxy for survival. So we're assuming that the, the stressors or the, and the capture probability um, that are undergone by each of the four groups here is equivalent, and that any differences in uh, the recapture um, proportions that we see between these groups is a result of uh, the differential survival uh, between the groups. Here's some results. Um, a lot of numbers on the screen. I'll direct you just to the, the, the two blue boxes here, which are the most important. The left-hand box is the treatments uh, from the control to the cannula, which is the, the black handle tool, uh, then the needle, and then recompression, which is that black tip descender device. The proportion returned is our recapture rate. So for the control fish, those just thrown back at the surface, uh, we got about 18% back. And then for the other three, the uh, all three barotrauma relief groups, we had in the upper 20s with 26.1, uh, 26.6, .6, and 28.6% of uh, released fish recaptured, uh, with the, the descender device being the highest. Showing that same information graphically, uh, taken from our published paper in North American Journal of Fisheries Management, I'm showing you the, uh, the, the time scale um, curves of survival curves for the four groups here. And I want to point out that the y-axis is the proportion not recaptured here. So if you're higher up on that y-axis, that means lower, uh, a lower number of recaptures and therefore a lower estimated survival. So the black line is none or the control that we're throwing back at the surface. Uh, the needle and the venting tool are um, uh, higher survival and they're basically neck and neck. And then the descender was pretty close, uh, but the best overall, the highest survival um, overall. So a couple of caveats uh, from this study here. Um, the first one is that this study took place in a single depth, uh, 38 meters or about 125 feet. And everybody who was venting uh, the fish in this study were uh, experienced users of those tools. So namely the, the authors of the, uh, of the paper, myself, Paul, and Jeff. Um, so these are some things, you know, working in different depths could alter the, uh, the survival rates and uh, whether or not the venting is performed by someone who knows where to stick the needle, how deep to stick it, um, things like that, uh, could alter the survival rate. So we actually have an ongoing study right now where we're repeating this and looking in uh, multiple depth ranges. And also uh, we're involving other user groups. So um, head, boat, uh, head boat anglers who are self-identified as inexperienced versus those that are identified as experienced uh, with the venting tools to try to um, tease out whether there's really any difference in uh, survival rate depending on the experience of the person applying that uh, barotrauma relief. So the studies uh, uh, that I have talked about so far are all with conventional tagging, but conventional tagging has some drawbacks. Um, it's difficult to use conventional tagging to estimate release survival of rare species because you really need a high sample size uh, to get where we want to be. Um, with a study like this. And that's very unlikely with a fish like speckled hind. You're never gonna tag uh, a several hundred speckled hind. Um, it's just not gonna happen. Uh, for deeper species, you can't use that nice scuba control. Um, venting may not work with larger animals and, and animals that come from deeper water uh, simply because of the volume of gas 
um, that exists inside that body cavity. Uh, another drawback of conventional tagging uh, is that it's it's piecemeal observations, right? So you, you're only seeing those fish when you release them, uh, and then when either you, the researchers, recapture them, or when an angler recaptures the fish and calls in the tag, you just have that that sort of starting line and finish line. You don't see what happens uh, during the race, um, and then you only observe a small proportion or small percentage of tagged fish. Uh, so um, it's uh, these are the drawbacks for all the benefits of conventional tagging. Um, it, it's not uh, it's it's not the end all be all of tagging stuff. So now I'm going to talk about uh, by far the most advanced type of uh, tagging and estimation of um, discard or release survival, and that's electronic tag. And here I'm going to go through two different case studies, uh, first with deep water groupers and then with red snapper. And I'm going to go through these um, in sequence, not concurrently, because uh, the methods and the findings were uh, different for these two studies, quite a bit different. So the first case study here uh, was something that I worked on as part of my PhD, and this was a, um, a release survival estimation of deep water groupers. Um, what are deep water groupers? Well, they're groupers uh, that live in deep water, you guessed it. Uh, these generally exist from 60 meters uh, out to uh, maybe 300 meters, but where we worked for this study was 60 to 140 meters. Um, and this is really a group of species where that cohabitation issue that I discussed at the beginning of the talk can really start to uh, be a problem because they live in such deep water. Um, there are a lot of rare species like speckled hind that live in this depth range. And uh, because of their uh, depth and because of their physiology, um, the barotrauma is so severe that for many of these species, the assumed post-release survival rate is 0%. And that's because almost all uh, of these fish float when they're released uh, if you don't take any sort of um, uh, uh, action there. Uh, in fact, for snowy grouper, the, the recreational regulations right now are one per vessel per day, no size requirement. Um, and so the idea is that the first snowy grouper uh, the, the vessel encounters is the one that's supposed to be kept. Um, and then in theory, uh, the vessel stops fishing in that area. Uh, and so no snowy grouper are discarded. Well, in actuality, um, people can perfectly legally stay in the same area and continue to fish for other species, which results in bycatch of snowy grouper and then uh, discards of snowy grouper. Uh, and then of course, um, an increase in fishing mortality because of those discards. So anyway, this is this is really uh, a group where the, the barotrauma related discard mortality is a huge deal. Um, and uh, we had a number of cooperators for this study, uh, Tom Burgess, Dale Britt, Jackie Dufour, and Patrick Dufour. So, uh, thanks to them for making this this work possible. Um, okay, so electronic tagging. What is electronic tagging? Well, instead of a conventional tag or a streamer tag that has information printed on it, electronic tags are, uh, in this case, acoustic transmitters are about the size and shape of a AA battery. Um, this For this study, we used Vemco V13AP tags. AP stands for acceleration and pressure. That's going to be pretty important uh, a little later on as I talk about the methods of this study. And these particular tags cost about $800 each. Um, so a big difference versus the conventional tags. And these tags are affixed to the exterior of the fish uh, with a couple of plastic dart tips. You can see um, how that works in the lower left-hand side uh, uh, portion of the slide here. And uh, we use this external attachment because unlike some uh, uh, electronic tagging studies that do surgery, um, this study, we didn't want to make a hole or an incision in the body cavity and use surgery because that could uh, inadvertently release some of those built up gases and we wouldn't get a clean look at whether uh, these fish are able to survive release without venting those gases. Um, so anyway, external attachment, there's how the transmitter attaches. Uh, and then these tags make noise, they're acoustic tags. It's, an, it's, it's not, uh, you can't, human ears cannot hear it, it's 69 kilohertz. But what can hear it are these passive acoustic receivers. Uh, I'm showing you an acoustic receiver rig um, that I'm holding in the photo on the right-hand side of the slide. And uh, the receiver itself is that black cylinder with a cone on top, a hydrophone on top. These are also made by the company that makes the tags. And the receivers cost about five grand. Um, we used 22 of them in this study. So that's, that's quite a bit of dough. Um, and these receivers have what's called an acoustic release. That's where the AR comes from in the, in the name of the receiver an acoustic release that allows us to retrieve it without using scuba divers or a service float or anything like that. Basically, we, we drop a, a hydrophone over the side of the boat, uh, it contacts the receiver and signals it 
um, to let go of the anchor and then the receiver and the float uh, come to the surface. And we are able to download uh, the, the acoustic detections um, of, of our fish off of that receiver. So for this study, we also used recompression. Uh, here we used the sequelizer descender device, which is, as far as I know, the most advanced descender device. Um, the, the first two photos show you how to attach the sequelizer to the lower jaw uh, of a fish. That's a silk snapper in the photo there. And the sequelizer is especially nice because it has an incorporated pressure sensor that can trigger the release of uh, the device, the opening of the jaws, um, at a pre-appointed depth. So this sequelizer device that we used in this study can be triggered to open at 100, 200, or 300 feet. Um, so it's a versatile tool. It costs about $60 each, and uh, they come from a company uh, in Florida. Uh, so the right-hand photo is me getting ready to drop a speckled hind back into the water. You can see that that rig is attached to a fishing line that Captain Tom is holding there um, at the, uh, the bow of this boat. I'll, I'll give you a zoom in of that photo there. Um, so that's a speckled hind. You can see the acoustic transmitter is attached to the dorsal muscle of that fish. Um, notice the eyes of that fish are bugged out of the head. So there's your, your barotrauma sign there. Uh, and then you see the sequelizer behind my arm is, is attached to uh, the jaws of the fish. The bottom of this whole rig has several pounds of lead weight to drag it back down. Uh, and then there's the, the uh, GoPro camera, upward facing GoPro camera. Um, that is uh, going to tell us what that fish looked like when it was released. So we tried to record all of these releases so we could get some information about the fish uh, at the moment they were released um, and then uh, combine that with the acoustic information that we would get uh, for, for a long, in a long-term sense uh, to look at the behavior of these animals. So I'm going to show you a little video here. It's about a minute and 30 seconds long. Uh, this is me with a big red grouper that we caught a couple summers ago. Looking up, Towards, uh, you can see the outriggers and everything of this vessel. Um, we're snapping the, the sequelizer to the lower jaw of this fish, and then we're going to splash it down. Notice the eyes are bugged out. This fish had experienced some pretty severe barotrauma. See that the, uh, the gill plates are flared out. The mouth is wide open. Um, if you could see it there, the stomach is, is up into the uh, mouth. And this fish is really not moving very much at all as we start our descent here. Um, it's just uh, been barotraumatized um, pretty severely. Now, watch what happens as we drag it down into the water column. So look what happened right there. The fish recompressed, and now it's swimming quite well. Um, the eyes are back in. The mouth is closed up. We caught this fish in 215 feet of water. Uh, so we set the device to release at 200 feet. So when we release, uh, reach 200 feet, the, the jaws of the sequelizer will pop open, um, and now the red grouper is able to swim under its own power. And this video is uh, particularly nice because you can see the seafloor come into view there on the left-hand side of the screen. And then from the top, there is our red grouper. And you can see it level out, and it goes back to doing uh, what we might call grouper-like things. Um, we tagged this fish in May of 2018, and we uh, had a um, uh, receivers in the area until October of that same year. Uh, and we tracked that fish uh, doing a live grouper type things all the way till the end of that study. So I mentioned in this study, we had uh, 22 acoustic receivers out. Um, here's a map of the study, which actually took place in the Snowy Wreck Marine Protected Area. Um, so you can see the shelf break there with the contour lines that are pretty close to each other. Uh, and you can see the bullseye symbols are the grouper releases or locations of grouper releases. The star symbols are where we had our receivers. Um, and then uh, other methods of this study, we needed to determine fate uh, of each of these fish. So to assign a fate is to determine whether each released fish lived or died. Um, so for this study, we used something called a negative control, which is that we took some groupers that we caught and sacrificed them, killed them on the deck of the boat, tagged them, and then descended them just as we would have with uh, a live fish or an unknown fate fish. And then we can use uh, those, the, the way that those animals behave um, to say something about whether the other fish lived or died. For this procedure, I used a hidden Markov model, which is a time series model um, that uses the depth and acceleration uh, information about each tag uh, to inform those fates. And so we could compare the movement, the depth and acceleration of the released alive fish to the known dead or negative control individual. 
in the, the hidden Markov model, you, uh, the user has to select the number of uh, states that are used. And so for this model, we used three states. So what it basically did is for each ping uh, or each detection of the tag, um, the model placed it into either state one, two, or three. As it turned out, states one and two in our model represented live groupers. Uh, two states were necessary because live groupers exhibit a range of uh, depth and acceleration behaviors. And then state three referred to uh, the predator um, or scavenger in this model. So I'm gonna walk you through three different plots here, three plots for three different fish. And I wanna orient you with what we're looking at here. They're all gonna be two panel plots. So this is the first one. The upper panel is acceleration uh, in meters per second squared. It's going from zero to 2.5 meters per second squared. And the lower panel is depth in meters. So uh, this is actually inverse depth. In other words, a higher depth or deeper depth is at the bottom of the panel and the uh, surface would be at the top of the panel. Um, the x-axis scale here is important to note because it's gonna change drastically be between the three plots that I showed you. So the first plot that we're looking at here represents about one day uh, worth of information. And this is all the information we got for this tag. There was no more. Uh, important things to note are that the acceleration for this fish was never at 0.0, .0 meters per second squared, um, except for that very first ping. Other than that, it was, uh, it was moving around um, and it was never stationary. The depth, uh, similarly, the depth movements of this fish sort of ranged up and down, uh, and you never really saw a, uh, a nice horizontal um, aggregation or cluster of depth pings that would suggest to us uh, that the animal was sort of hanging out on the seafloor. And we know that this fish was dead because this is one of our sacrificed fish. This is a negative control. Um, so all, all of these movements, all the acceleration and all the depth readings here uh, were actually coming from um, the mouth of the stomach of a predator, um, most likely a large shark. So this fish, uh, second one I'm showing you, was um, released alive, or it was a what we'll call an unknown fate individual. First thing to notice is that instead of one day, we're now looking at about eight days worth of information. Um, the second thing that you probably noticed is that we, we now have uh, green and red pigs. Um, you have probably already inferred what that means, but I'll walk you through it. So focus on the acceleration pings, the top panel that are green uh, in color. Notice that almost all of those pings are pretty dang close to 0.0, .0 meters per second squared. We have this nice grassy lawn of uh, very, very stationary uh, movements. Then we have uh, these occasional blips that range up to about five meters per second squared. But the vast majority of those pings that are green in the acceleration panel are right at zero. Also looking at the green points in the depth panel, we now see this kind of neat uh, horizontal aggregations that occur, these clusters that occur. And so look at between May 2nd and May 3rd, a lot of those pings are, are forming a line that's right at 100 meters. And then uh, as we turn from May 2nd to May 3rd, it jumps up to about 90 meters. What that is, is the fish moving what I'll call up the hill or up the mountain, because uh, this is in an area of the, the continental shelf that drops off very rapidly. So there's high vertical relief. here. So um, groupers and other reef fish will utilize that habitat. Uh, and so sliding up maybe 10 meters of vertical distance um, might not be uh, very far at all horizontally. So anyway, that fish used uh, different portions of the continental shelf break all the way through the morning of May 5th, and then something happened, something bad happened. And uh, now from here on out, all the, all the pings are red, uh, and you see this jump way up in the water column to maybe 30 meters. You see the acceleration skyrocket, and then the fish disappears for about uh, three days, and then comes back, and when it comes back, we have no more 0.0, .0 acceleration pings, and the depth readings look entirely different. Now, instead of having these horizontal clusters, um, we have this sort of up and down thing going on. Uh, and so, yeah, you guessed it, uh, that this was a uh, release mortality. This fish um, was picked up by a predator on the morning of May 5th uh, and then left the array on May 10th and we never heard from it again. Uh, so this one was categorized as a, as a discard or uh, release mortality. Okay, the third and final one that I'll show you here. Um, take a look at the, uh, the green and purple acceleration things. And you see for the green, uh, they're almost all at zero. It looks like a live fish. Uh, the depth readings are clustered around 120 meters. Maybe this fish didn't have a ledge in 100 meters or what have you that it'd like to use. Um, so it's just hanging out at, at maybe 120 to 118 meters. 
Then it jumps up to a different depth area um, September 1st, and it's uh, now it's in state one, which is purple. Um, and then I want to draw your attention to what I'll call the baseline of the acceleration pings. Um, the, the bottom of the, the lowest acceleration pings where it's purple here, uh, it, it sort of creeps up right until the point where the, the pings uh, go straight back down to 0, 0.0, and then from then on out, uh, there is no more uh, positive acceleration. So what we think happened there is that this tag actually became loose on the side of the fish. We suspect that um, the tag, uh, one of the, the white plastic dart tips probably pulled out. The tag was swinging around, which was providing uh, what I'll call false positive acceleration readings. And then on about September 10th, uh, the tag fell off entirely. Um, and that's where the acceleration goes to zero and the depth flatlines. Um, so that's tag loss. Uh, so until that point, uh, the fish was alive and happy. Um, and so it lived for about a month plus before it lost its tag. So this fish was categorized as a survival. The overall results of the, uh, the first electronic tagging study here, the deepwater grouper study, is that we tagged about 40 groupers across six different species. And uh, our overall survival estimate was 0.46 or 46%. Um, this may not sound like a lot. You were keeping less than one in two groupers alive using this methodology. But recall that for a lot of these species, including snowy grouper, uh, it's assumed that 100% of these fish die after they're, after they're released. So this is 46% is a big improvement over 0%. As many of you are probably aware, descender devices are now required on all vessels fishing for uh, or possessing reef species uh, in the South Atlantic region. And this paper was published in the North American Journal uh, of Fisheries Management last year, um, and it was funded by the Salt and Salt Kennedy Grant. Okay, so uh, I've got about 10 minutes left, and I want to talk about one more study here. This is uh, the most recent study. Um, it's also an electronic tagging study, and it deals with red snapper. Uh, I'm going to show you this, this map again um, in a second, but uh, what I want to point out is that the black dots are receivers, the white dots are live releases, and the red dots, we again used a negative control here. Um, the red dots are dead releases. This study also took place off of uh, uh, the central North Carolina coastline. Here we used V13P tags, so just pressure, no acceleration uh, in this study. And these tags cost about $700 per. And uh, we used a, a new kind of attachment method here that, that Nate Bachelor developed, um, where we have this stainless steel wire that's wrapped around uh, the tag tightly. And uh, there's marine grade 5200 uh, adhesive sealant underneath that bit of heat shrink on the end of that tag. And then the, the other end, the right hand end of the uh, stainless steel wire is sharpened to a point and then it's inserted through the dorsal musculature of the fish. Uh, two washers are threaded on the non-tag end, and then a crimp is threaded on. It's pulled tight, crimp shut, and then the, the tag end of the wire is uh, cut, and then the fish is uh, released. And in the study, we again used the sequelizer device. We again used release videos here. I'm not going to show you one of those, um, but here's a still image from one uh, on the left. You can see the tag indicated by a red arrow and the sequelizer device indicated by the uh, yellow arrow. So the positive control uh, here that I'm indicating on the right is something that was novel to us in this study. And that's that we were able to actually confirm the survival of some of these fish um, by visually recapturing or uh, reciting them using uh, baited camera traps that we deployed into the area. Um, so in this image, you can clearly see that this is fish number 33. So we have this video and we can, we can definitively say, okay, red snapper number 33 uh, was alive from the time of release until at least the moment that we observed it on this video. So that's really useful. Um, and uh, we'll talk about um, how we use that in a, in a couple of slides here. So here's that plot again. And this is a much denser receiver array than what I used in the grouper study in the Snowy Rack MPA. This receiver array um, was set up to do uh, something called a VEMCO positioning system or a fine scale acoustic tracking study. So because these receivers are only about 200 meters apart and they're arranged in this nice neat grid, uh, you can, we can use the information that all the, the pings of these fish to uh, get fine scale position information to about the one meter resolution on almost a minute by minute basis, as long as the fish remained within the array uh, and detections were picked up on at least three receivers um, that can be triangulated, the position can be triangulated. 
Uh, and so Vemco, the company that supplies the receivers and the, and the tags, also offers this service where you send all of the te detections that you download off your receivers to them. Uh, and then um, for, for a modest fee, they'll send you back the fine scale position information uh, for all the fish. So let's take a look at what that looked like. Um, fine scale position information for, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of fish here. So this first one is a known dead red snapper. This is a sacrificed uh, and released dead red snapper. And the, the map, uh, the left-hand panel, shows you the spatial movements of this tag after it was released. So because we know this fish was dead, uh, any movements of this tag are, we know are coming from the stomach of a predator. And so this tag you can see um, moved around. Uh, it was big, big time steps uh, from one ping to the next. It was a huge uh, uh, distance. And then the right-hand panel is showing you um, two different pieces of information. Well, there's no speed on this graph, but if there were, it would be in red. Uh, the left-hand y-axis is depth going from the surface at the top down to the seafloor, close to 40 meters at the bottom. And uh, on the right, we have speed um, from 1.0 at the top to 0, 0.0 meters per second. What's important here is that uh, for the depth information that we got for this tag, a lot of the pings were very close to the, to the uh, surface, and this animal was using the entire water column. Um, for some of the known dead individuals, we got speed information, uh, which we calculated um, by uh, uh, just dividing the distance traveled by um, the, the time that elapsed between two different positions. And uh, for the, the known dead individuals, the predators, a lot of the speed values were at or above 0 0.5 meters per second. So here I'm showing you a known alive individual. So this red snapper number 33, um, this is one day's worth of information that was just uh, from a couple of days before we recited this, this uh, individual red snapper with a camera trap. Notice that the spatial information on the left-hand panel uh, is way different than uh, for the known alive versus the known dead fish. The known alive fish was uh, restricted to little areas that tended to correspond with where there was interesting hard bottom structure, as we can tell from the multi-beam uh, uh, sonar survey. And then the right-hand panel, you can see that while there is some vertical movement of this fish, the black line, uh, it doesn't go anywhere near the surface. The highest up it went on this particular day uh, was about 17 meters below the surface. Um, and all the speed detections, the red line here in the right-hand panel, uh, were pretty close to zero. Um, they, you know, they ranged up to maybe about 0 0.25 or 0 0.3 uh, meters per second. So from those known dead and known alive individuals, in this study we created a flowchart that we used to assign each individual uh, an eventual fate. And those fates for this study were tag loss, emigration, uh, live fish or survival, and then uh, discard or release mortality. And we used that information that I just described in those plots, um, such as how close to the seafloor were those detections? Um, did the detections cover a, a large spatial extent or uh, were they relatively restricted in their in their spatial extent? Uh, we looked at the speed. Was it always or almost always below 0 0.5 meters per second? And then if the detection stopped, of course, the fish was no longer uh, in the array. So that would result in um, a categorization of emigration. Uh, so overall for this study, our empirical estimate of survival when red snapper are jaw hooked and released with a descender device was 93%, 0 0.93. Um, but again, I want to stress that that is for jaw-hooked individuals that are released with a descender device. But we would like to know what is the survival uh, overall fishery-wide for including red snapper that are not jaw-hooked. We know that survival depends on hooking location. If a fish is hooked in the gills or uh, deep-hooked, it is likely to have lower survival. We also know that hooking location depends on hook type. Um, for Common or main hook types in the South Atlantic are uh, circle and J hooks, and then the non offset and the offset versions of both of those hooks. So, in this study, we used a simulation to estimate hook type used in the fishery as well as hooking location by hook type. We got th that information from the Charter and Headboat Observer data uh, from the state of Florida, and Bev Sauls provided that data. She's a co author uh, on this study. And then we looked in the literature for information on the survival of red snapper. Uh, if they were not uh, jaw hooked. We have our own empirical estimate if they were jaw hooked, but we wanted to know um, how much lower is it if they're hooked in the in somewhere other than the jaw. Uh, 
here we have estimates, and I won't go through these um, individually one by one, but this is part of the simulation. We have estimates of the proportion of hook uh, use, proportion of catch, that are caught with the four different hook types, offset and non-offset, circle and J. And then for each of those same four hook types, we have the proportion of fish that are jaw hooked. Using our empirical estimate of survival for jaw hooked fish, and then our literature review estimates for non-jaw hooked fish, we came up with an overall survival estimate for the recreational fishery, if every fish were descended of 87% or 0.87, um, with a pretty tight uh, range, confidence range there, 83 to 90. Um, we would have liked to have done this for the commercial sector, but we, uh, we couldn't find um, a high enough sample size and, and uh, uh, information for the commercial sector in order to do that same procedure. So we, we stuck to recreational for this um, particular study. This is a narrow depth range, uh, 37, 38 meters, but it's representative, we think, of the fishery and where the fishery operates. Um, but we would like to have better data on the private recreational uh, hook use. That could be uh, used to refine our findings because here we're relying on charter and headboat, uh, which may not actually be representative of what's going on in the private recreational sector. Um, but as many of you are aware, it's, it's pretty difficult to pin down uh, what exactly is going on in the private recreational sector. So this study is in press. It's been accepted at the journal Marine and Coastal Fisheries. Uh, I'm happy to furnish a PDF upon request. Um, and I want to say that this study was funded by uh, internal, several internal grants at NOAA uh, that, were, that were obtained by Nate Bachelor um, as the, the overall study lead. There are a couple more papers that came out of this tagging effort. Um, and I, I've only uh, had time to talk about this one today. So, uh, okay, that's the end of the talk. Um, I've got a summary slide here just stating that release uh, estimating release mortality is important, reminding you which methods I talked about. And then I've got my email address, my website uh, on the screen, and then the QR code will take you directly to that red grouper uh, recompression video that's on YouTube. So if you're interested in uh, looking at that video on your own time or sharing it with others, um, please do. Uh, we're up to almost 5,000 views, so um, please take a look at that. Uh, okay, I will uh, stop talking and turn it over to Chip um, to moderate the questions, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation today, Brendan. And now we're gonna be opening it up for questions. Once again, if you have questions, um, you can ask them in two different ways. One is by clicking on the hand raised icon. It's the icon that kind of looks like a turkey. It should have a, a green arrow pointing down. That means your hand is down. If you click on it, it should turn red, it, indicating that your hand is raised. After that, I will unmute you and you will hear the webinar say you are now unmuted and you'll need to unmute yourself by clicking on the red microphone. And with that, we have our first question from Spud Woodward. Spud, you should, there you go. Right, uh, can, you, can, you, can you hear me, Chip? We can hear you, Spud. All right, very good, thanks. Um, appreciate the presentation, Brandon. That's uh, very informative. Uh, a couple of questions. One is uh, approximately how long was, in your telemetry studies, the fish at the surface being handled for the um, uh, attachment of the tag. Uh, uh, and then the second question, and I think I know the answer to this, but uh, obviously telemetry studies are much more expensive than conventional tagging studies, but I'd like your opinion on whether the, the value of the information produced by the telemetry studies makes them really what should be the gold standard for these types of studies. So, Thank you. Yeah, great questions. Uh, thanks, Spud. So the first one, how long were the fish at the surface? Um, we, in both efforts, the, the, the deep water grouper and the red snapper study, um, we of course were as expeditious as possible. Um, we need to get certain things like the total length of the fish uh, and then uh, perform the tagging. Um, in both of these studies, uh, the average was about 60 to 90 seconds uh, the fish was held at the surface. Uh, so good question, uh, and there there are studies, of course, to suggest that the longer the surface interval, um, the the lower the survival rate there. Uh, as far as the expense of telemetry studies versus uh, conventional tagging studies, I'll point out that um, while I did give a, a couple of tidbit uh, piecemeal information there on the, the cost of tags, uh, the cost of um, people is virtually equivalent. Uh, chartering a vessel, um, uh, you know, paying for university overhead, uh, paying 
um, graduate student stipends and whatnot is equivalent across those two studies. So while the tags and receivers do cost a lot for telemetry, um, uh, the, the overall cost of uh, accomplishing a study like this uh, can be approximately equivalent depending on what sort of uh, cooperators and, and who's involved. Um, but I'll still answer your question whether uh, I think the value of telemetry studies is greater. And it's a tough question. I think it certainly depends. But I would say that the, the telemetry studies are, uh, in my opinion, the gold standard um, for, uh, for survival studies. Uh, there are some assumptions that go into that, like the, the, the telemetry tag doesn't itself influence the survival of the fish, um, and we don't think that it does. Uh, but the, the information that you get is, is really interesting, uh, and it's not just the survival rate that we're looking at in a lot of these studies. We're also um, uh, studying other things about the biology, the biology of these animals. Uh, and so just to give you an example, there, there are at least three papers that will come out of the red snapper uh, tagging study that have um, uh, one's already out on vertical movements of red snapper that uh, was basically a, a completely novel finding that red snapper move upwards in the water column uh, during upwelling events. Nate Bachelor is the, the lead on that. And then we have another one uh, in press at, at the uh, Canadian Journal on how red snapper respond to baited traps that will be really useful for surveys like CFIS. Um, so uh, if, you, if you slice the telemetry study into <laughs> the cost of that study into thirds, um, you know, by the number of papers that are eventually reduced, uh, produced and the, the amount of biological knowledge that's generated, uh, telemetry studies are, in my opinion, well worth it. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. I appreciate that. Sure thing. All right. The next person is Mike Larkin. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. We got oh, it. Yeah. So I was always wondering if I could be heard. So yeah, Brendan, great presentation, very what of mission, great presentation. So I wanted your opinion on um, natural mortality versus release mortality. So for some of these long-term tracks, like meaning if you tag a fish and then three months from now a predator eats it, I would lean toward that death natural mortality. I wanted your opinion on you know what is release mortality, what is natural mortality? Do you have like a cutoff or a time period you look at to separate those? Yeah, great question. Uh, thank you for that. So um, to use your example, if we saw uh, a, one of these groupers or snappers uh, get eaten uh, or change to a predator uh, style movement pattern after three months, I think we would agree with you, your in inference there, that that's natural mortality and not F discard. Um, for all of these studies, uh, ours, as well as many other great uh, telemetry studies, survival studies that have been done for red snapper and other species, there typically is a stated uh, cutoff. Um, I have used uh, 14 days. Uh, I have seen uh, two or three days be used. I have seen published studies where the only mortalities occurred on uh, the first day. Um, in fact, our red snapper study, uh, the only inferred uh, discard mortalities or release mortalities occurred on the day of tagging. Um, and so uh, we didn't really have to go up against that decision of, well, was this M or was this F discard? Um, so uh, it's a case-by-case -case basis, and all you can do is use all the information you have. Um, I will say that it has been shown uh, that sharks and other predators will often preferentially feed on uh, fish that are uh, impaired in some way. And so uh, if three months from now, the fish that it has the tag on it is swimming uh, a little differently than other fish that don't have tags, that one might be picked off um, preferentially uh, uh, by a shark versus um, one that, that doesn't have a tag. And so that would sort of confound the results there because that would be kind of like a tagging induced mortality. Um, so there, there are shades of gray, let's, let's put it that way. But generally there's a cutoff and it's, it's often a very short time scale. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The next question comes from the, the chat function. Um, it comes from Lauren Gentry. Uh, you mentioned differences in experience of users for descending and venting tools. How hard is it to learn these techniques? And is venting location or descender placement different for, for each species? Hey, Lauren. Thanks for the question. Um, glad you were able to listen today. So. Uh, yeah, so venting uh, location sometimes does differ by species, and it can be um, 
generally thought of as the same location, but if you look at the morphology of, say, a gray triggerfish versus a black sea bass, um, those are very different body types. And so having the knowledge of where to stick that needle um, is, uh, is very important. But it is easy to learn. Uh, and in general, the, these most reef fish have the same body type. So if you exclude like gray triggerfish and, and other laterally, very laterally compressed fish, um, if you just talk about like groupers, snappers, uh, black sea bass, uh, you can teach someone in five minutes where to appropriately stick that needle um, and hopefully at that point they are an experienced user and they and they won't uh, forget where to do that what i have seen uh on these headboats and and i'm sure it's occurring in other sectors um, i've just personally seen it on headboats is sometimes the needle will get introduced into uh locations that might actually um, uh, increase mortality such as you'll sometimes see people pop the stomach the the, the organ that's coming out the mouth um, that's not ideal because now you have a hole in the digestive tract that can introduce a uh, septic condition into that fish's body. I've seen people uh, insert the needle along the ventral midline, the, the bottom, uh, the, the, the median bottom of the fish. Uh, again, you have to go through the digestive organs to get into the, where that expanded gas is there. So um, uh, not ideal. Uh, as far as descender device placement, anywhere on the jaw or any, uh, as long as that fish goes down, Theoretically, you're doing okay. Um, I guess I would say that the sequelizer with a small enough fish, you could clip it through the gills, which would not be great. You never want to introduce a foreign body like your fingers or a descender device uh, into making contact with the gills that can that can cause uh, delayed mortality. Um, but again, very easy to teach. Uh, and so education and outreach are, are super important for both descending and venting. All right, I'm not seeing any other hands raised right now, so I'll, oh, there's Spud. Go ahead, Spud. Yeah, thanks, Chip. The, the discussion about the predators made me, me think about something. Um, obviously, you know, we're trying to, to encourage people to use the sanding devices. Uh, you know, this required now in the Gulf and the South Atlantic, but, you know, we're, we're going to continue to, to, to work to change folks' behavior. Um, one thing that has come up, and, and I'm curious whether you know of any information about the descent rates of fish that are dented versus uh, fish that are that are put on descending devices. Obviously, a fish that's on a descending device uh, is descended at a pretty rapid rate, controlled by the person uh, holding the fishing rod or the downrigger or whatever the device is attached to. Um, but just in your experience working in these types of studies, do you believe that the fish that are on descending devices get to the bottom quicker, uh, potentially get past surface predators quicker, and therefore uh, you, you've got that sort of added benefit versus a fish that's been vented, and while you may be alleviating the bear trauma symptoms partially or possibly even completely, that fish is still maybe not getting to the bottom as quickly as, as a fish on a descending device. I just appreciate your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, really good question. Um, I, I certainly agree that uh, descender, descended fish descend much more rapidly than vented fish. And I also agree that uh, a more rapid rate of descent gets fish back down to their habitat where they can potentially hide um, much more quickly. So I, I uh, concur. Uh, with the assertion that that is an added benefit of descender devices. Um, uh, to, to preempt any follow-up questions on, is there such a thing as too rapid a rate of descent? In other words, could you uh, harm a fish by pulling it down too quickly? Um, the answer is probably not. Uh, just, if, I guess if you had, the only thing I can think of is if you had a tiny black sea bass and you put like 30 pounds of weight on there and threw it down, you might wind up uh, perforating uh, the gills of that fish. But in all actuality, um, no one's going to do that. No one's going to put that much weight on for a small fish. So I always overdo it on my personal vessel uh, when I'm descending. I take an electric reel and um, put a whole bunch of weight on there so I'm ready for anything. When I catch a big red snapper, I'm ready to go uh, with like eight or nine pounds of lead. Um, and I know that that fish is going to get back down to the bottom. So um, anyway, answered a question that wasn't asked there. But uh, uh, to answer your question, yeah, an added benefit of descenders. 
Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Judd Curtis is next. Hey, Brendan, uh, Judd here. Thanks for the presentation and uh, congrats on your defense. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, one is real basic. In some of that conventional tagging, you're showing that the control actually had the lowest survival rate, which is obviously like um, not true, but what, what was the cause there? And then um, also just with all the, you know, through the camera work, coupled with the acoustic telemetry and accelerometers and, and uh, speed analysis, you can really start to get a good handle on the predation events, which you know, I think contribute to the bulk of, of depredation mortality. Um, what are there other kind of methods or where do you see kind of that, that kind of progressing as you kind of get a better handle on trying to quantify the amount of, of depredation that's actually hurt, uh, is occurring in the in discard in regulatory discards? Yeah, so um, nice chatting with you, Judd. Thanks for tuning in today. I'll, I'll answer the first question first. Uh, you said the control had the lowest survival. You must have been talking about the the uh, black sea bass study with the varied uh, release treatments, the two types of venting and the uh, the descent. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so there, the, the, what we were calling the control were the surface released or untreated uh, fish. So that's why they had the lowest survival because a lot of them floated. Um, oh, okay. Gotcha. That makes sense. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Yep. Yeah, sorry. Sorry if that wasn't clear, but um, hopefully it is now. And then uh, as far as methods for, uh, for, for observing or estimating predation or depredation, um, I've actually only seen once in our studies off North Carolina, uh, a release video that, that showed uh, anything that looked like depredation. And it wasn't the actual depredation event. It was just the tail of a shark uh, sliding into the frame as we pulled the camera back to the surface. Um, so, I mean, of course, if you observe depredation on, on camera, then you've got a smoking gun. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, the only other methodology that I can think of other than those that I talked about today is that uh, Vemco and, and I think maybe uh, one or two other companies now have a, a tag that is specifically designed to provide a predation signal when the pH of that tag or the light uh, surrounding that tag changes. In other words, the tag will either uh, chemically um, or uh, using an optical sensor change how it's pinging if it is inside of a predator. So um, that's a, a technology that I have, I have not yet used. Um, but that is something that could be applied in a situation like this uh, to get at uh, whether depredation or predation are occurring in types of these types of studies. I hope that answered your question. Brett. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I've, I've heard about those. I have, I've not used them uh, before either. I'd be curious to see if what kind of results we're generating from those uh, those predation detection tags. And uh, I just uh, if you want to see a, a good barracuda depredation video on Snapper, send me an email and I can send it to you. <laughs> I've got a pretty good one. Great. That's, that sounds exciting. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Brennan. Yep. All right. This is Chip. Uh, I'll ask a question since I'm not seeing any hands raised or any more questions in the question log. But, you know, I noticed with uh, at least one of the shark events um, that it was swimming around with that tag in its body for about three days. And I'm wondering, could you potentially use something like a, a feeding event for a snowy grouper or a speckled hind, have them swallow the tag, and maybe try to use something like that as a control? Have you guys tried to see how long it one of these tags might last in a grouper-like species? Well, that's a good question and a good suggestion. Um, uh, the direct answer to your question is we have not done that. Um, there are telemetry studies uh, where the tag was implanted in. Um, you know, gastrically, in other words, you force it down the throat of the fish. A couple problems with that are that uh, a lot of a lot of people on this call have probably seen uh, a grouper vomit when they come up from deep water. So we know that they're able to do that. And it's possible that uh, you would get that fish back down. It would immediately throw up your $800 tag and then, then your SOL. Um, the evacuation time of, uh, of a shark, uh, at least the shark species around here, are is, uh, you know, three to seven days. I'm not sure what the evacuation time of a, a large grouper would be, but you would certainly be restricting yourself to a short-term observations. Um, that that would be kind of cool. Uh, you know, um, it's it's not something we've done or considered. Uh, but if somebody wants to pay for it, we're, you know, I'm game. 
I'll, I'll make a GoFundMe account for it. That's great. I look forward to donating. <laughs> Any other questions? We'll give it another uh, 30 seconds or so. Yep, sure. All right. Uh, Judd has another question. Yeah, thanks, Chip. I'll ask another one. Renan, for any of the species, did you see any sort of any like differential uh, size differential survival, uh, or is the range that you tagged either conventional or acoustic pretty pretty narrow? Just thinking about you know like size limits and things and how that might affect discard mortality uh, in management. Yeah, good question. Um, so I'll kind of go through study by study as I recall here. Um, the Great Triggerfish study, no. Uh, the Black Sea Bass study with the with the varied release treatments, uh, we actually did see an effect, a significant effect of size, uh, total length of the fish in the Cox proportional hazards model. And we actually found that the larger fish were more likely to be recaptured. Um, that goes contrary to uh, intuition regarding the severity of barotrauma. Um, it's thought for many species that barotrauma is more severe in the larger fish and therefore you would expect a lower recapture rate. Uh, what, what I think occurred there is that uh, we were more likely to get recaptures of the fish that were retained and so the fish that were retained happened to be the ones that were larger. Um, so uh, we, you know, it's nice that we were able to control for size in the model uh, and so that's certainly something that should be accounted for in, in other studies as well. The grouper study and the red snapper study, uh, I don't think that, that we were able to show any sort of size effect. Um, with both studies, we did have a range uh, of sizes, but we didn't have a high enough sample size. One drawback of telemetry studies is that you have inherently a, a fairly low sample size, just restricted by um, the cost of the study, and then depending on what species you're, you're dealing with, the rarity of that particular animal. So. Um, I don't think we were able to demonstrate any sort of size effect with either of those studies, but it's it's always worth looking. All right, any other questions? I'm not seeing any. Thank you so much for your time today, everyone for attending and Brendan, uh, Brendan for speaking to the group. Um, and congratulations on your recently complete, uh, completed dissertation. Thanks, Chip. And uh, again, if anybody has any follow-ups, please um, drop me an email. All right. Everyone have a good afternoon.